right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, Doha Forum. Ahlan wa sahlan to Doha. It is great to have you all here. I'm Maria Ramos. I'm a news anchor at TRT World. I'm based in Istanbul, and it is a pleasure to have you all here. We have a fantastic lineup of guests here today. And uh, we'll be discussing reimagining business models in a post-pandemic era, a fantastic title. Has COVID changed business models forever? We know that there are seeds of opportunity in every crisis. So we'll be hearing about uh, lots of exciting projects today. As a reminder, we want to uh, take this conversation online. So for that, the hashtag is a Doha Forum. Very simple. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce our panel to you. Next to me is Mr. Mohammed Asawadi. He is the Chief Investment Officer for the Americas at the Qatar Investment Authority. Please join me in welcoming him. Next, we have Mr. Jaideep Bahman, who is the CEO of Rebel Foods. Please welcome him. And we go next to Mr. Segun Ogunsanya, who is the CEO of Airtel Africa. Welcome, sir. And next is Ms. Hande Chilingir, who is the co-founder and CEO and also one-time entrepreneur of Insider. Please welcome her. And right at the end, last but not least, we have Baiju Ravindran, who's the CEO of Baiju's. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Now, Mohammed, I'm going to start with you. You are a sovereign wealth fund. I, I love that name, sovereign wealth fund. Um, so you, 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 you have a big role. What exactly is that role of investment in, in driving innovation and making everything happen? Are you the guy that brings that magic to make everything happen? Well, uh, we'd, we'd love to be the only people, but I think uh, capital and partnership is only there to complement um, entrepreneurs as they go. For any big, long-lasting innovation, you would require to have an entrepreneur, a business that's trying to develop a software that is different, or a piece of hardware that changed the world, or a business model that we've seen a lot of business models changing over time. And for that, you'd require capital beside you. And I think the role we would like to play as a sovereign wealth fund is to utilize our ability to be a long-term investor and stay beside smart entrepreneurs and business models as they grow um, and support them. Because the journey is not always um, uh, easy. Um, there is a lot of hardship. There is a lot of time that you would require you would like your partners and investees to be beside you and give you a little bit of guidance and not only give you cash so it's a value add long-term investor this is what we're trying uh, to always uh, be so you said that the journey is not always easy so what else do you bring how do you transform business models then we enable businesses to be transformed we are a catalyst we're an enabler we try to develop a, a deep bench of internal expertise that could add value to the businesses. We try to be long-term investors um, and that could give guidance along the way. So I think the contribution is, is uh, the, a partnership from a capital format, but in addition to that, it's also from a skill and from adding value to the uh, entrepreneurs as they grow. I mean, we have good, great examples in QI, and maybe that would make it a little bit easier. So we invested in, in, in businesses when they were a concept. We invested in businesses when they're about to become a, a big business. One of the investments we've done was in a business in the healthcare industry. It's called Grail. So what they do is a, a new format for early detection of cancer. And it's a noble cause for all of us as long-term investors to be players in, in such space. And we've, through that investments, we enabled them to grow as other investors and took it to, to become material. Uh, so there's a lot of examples which we could allude to. Another example that uh, comes to my mind is, is also an investment we've done at Fluence. 
So it's an energy business based in the U.S. Its, no, it's, it's mission is really to drive um, uh, more and more renewable energy uh, and enable it. And as you know, renewable energy, the big um, um, uh, bottleneck is the energy storage uh, along the way. So their technology is really enabling um, energy storage in an efficient way, which I think is also another noble long-term innovation uh, that we as long-term investors have to invest money and time in. And how do you know what, what to pick? And has the pandemic actually changed uh, your investment patterns? Yeah. Uh, we would like to, I mean, I'd love to say that we have the crystal ball. And, and when it comes to picking, um, that's a lot of hard work. It's, it's a lot of investments in QIA as an institution have done on the people side. Um, you have to have a skill set. You have to have, um, uh, also you have to be credible if you think about it. Mm -hmm and predictable. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of capital, there's a lot of ways, there's, uh, you know, big competition, but I think with you becoming a skilled uh, individual in what you do, and a skilled institution in what you do, and having the credibility as an investor and as a partner, this definitely gives the strength to get more access to interesting opportunities. And then, and, and a, a very significant, a very high level overlay, which covers long-term thematic. Um, uh, views that uh, you can't change uh, every day. Post, I mean, th th thematic for 10, 15 years uh, into the future. Uh, some of those will be thematics. They may not work out. So you also have the ability and agility to, you know, flexibly change your approach and investment approach uh, along the way. Post pandemic, um, um, huge changes that occurred, occurred and, and not all of them are reversible. Uh, some of them are with us to stay. So give me an example, for example. Um, I mean, I mean, we have a lot, a lot of you know yeah. talented entrepreneurs, which they touched upon that, and, and they're, they're the actually their business models. But you see, the way we work is quite different now than what it used to be. The uh, flexible work you'd have to have an element of flexible work along the way. You see, in education, there's a lot of ways that you could deliver education post pandemic. Um, uh, that's quite you know quite favorable and quite different. Some of those things are not coming back. Another interesting approach as well, if you think of healthcare. So in the healthcare space, uh, where the pandemic enabled uh, regulators and, and people and scientists is to accept the fact that we could actually deal with a large scale problem. And this large scale problem could actually be resolved um, uh, within a few years. You'd have a vaccine widely spread, so, which, which is a good change. Um, so it's from a regulatory standpoint, from consumer behavior standpoint, from um, uh, you know, long-term behavioral changes in the way we conduct our everyday life. Um, and this also had a big impact on investment. Incredible. All right. Let's, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mohamed. I want to hear now from Jaideep. Now, your company is called Rebel Foods. That is a fantastic name. And you are an Indian online restaurant company. You're the largest cloud kitchen restaurant in the world, I believe. Incredible. So we all know globally the pandemic has changed the way we eat out. We weren't eating out. Some of us had to learn to cook. Uh, we could only order out as well. Um, so tell us, how did this change in the way we all eat benefit you, benefit your business model? Well, um, I guess, uh, you know, the, the business of restaurants uh, has been around for 500 years. You know, the first restaurant came in France very predictably um, back in 1600s. But in these 500 years, the business has been conducted in the same fashion. Like you have a big um, high street location where you go out and, and, and enter that location, beautiful ambience, you know, you eat. Um, over the last 20 years in internet, we've seen all models undergo massive transformations, retail, entertainment, taxi, travel, fashion. Um, I believe food is our restaurant, the business of restaurants is the last frontier of internet, where the fundamental change that has happened is real estate got disassociated with the brand. Like you used to walk into a McDonald's or a, or a nice fine dining restaurant. Today, a piece of real estate could be used to launch 20 brands, 20 restaurant brands, all to be delivered to your home. The customer doesn't know that it is coming from the same kitchen as long as you know, the food is great, the delivery is perfect. 
So it's a fundamental change in that business model. That has been happening secularly over the last sort of five, 10 years, as we know, the food delivery, the growth of food delivery, et cetera. What happened during pandemic is this change got accelerated massively. Like, for example, if you see a restaurant on the, on the high street, it might be serving, you know, you know, a sushi brand or a, or a Lebanese brand, but their kitchens are now being utilized to launch an internet restaurant, a virtual restaurant, which is only available on, on your phone. So changes like that, you know, like everything else in consumer goods, real estate is going to be costlier, technology is going to be cheaper. This is, this is like the, 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 the most eternal thrust of our world today. An internet restaurant, the business that we are doing, is doing exactly that. Not betting on the real estate, using the same real estate to launch new brands. It's, uh, I believe it's a, it's a very, very exciting opportunity uh, going forward, um, especially post-pandemic. And what happens to your business model when people start going back to restaurants and eating out? It's going to happen. Even today, you know, 85% of the world's shopping happens offline. Mm -hmm. But even then, Amazon is the world's second most valuable company. Only 15% of shopping happens online. So similarly, it's going to remain. You know, people eating out is going to remain. But at the same time, there would be opportunity. Like you are sitting at office, you know, between meetings. You know, you want to call people home. You want to order uh, from different restaurants, uh, nice food, etc. A lot of that is going to go to home. I mean, today the penetration of food delivery overall, even after the pandemic, is less than 10% worldwide. When this goes to 20%, 25%, that's massive growth. And, you know, so I'm not here to say that going out is going to go out. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, in retail, going out and shopping hasn't gone out of fashion. You know, still 80% of the world's retail is offline. It's going to be the same here. Um, but there would be significant change in terms of what else can happen with food. So the pandemic has been good for you? Initially, uh, not so much, but now it's looking fantastic. And I like your website. It describes what you do as where excellent food meets great tech. Um, so how do these two things mi mix together? Great question. So there are, I would say, two types of tech that have already occurred, and one type of tech is about to happen. The first two, the first one is, you know, making food. Um, now, my mom would be very angry with me if I say that this to her, but most cooking in the world is actually a combination of three things. Ingredients, dispensing, what you put when, at what quantity, and third, a combination of heat and movement. Any cuisine in the world could be dissected into these three parts. And then when you bring automation, robotics, AI into this, actually you can scale a chef's magic. AI into cooking. Yeah, because today a chef can create magic by dispensing or putting a particular spice at a particular point in time. If you capture that, and if you create dispensing machines that do that automatically, you can scale the chef's cuisine or cooking to thousands of locations without losing the art of cooking. That's what I think many people might be thinking, the art, the flavor. It's not lost in a cloud. It's not lost at all. In fact, technology keeps it there. So, so that's, uh, you know, that's one big technology that's going to happen. Uh, I mean, Driverless car is happening, so chefless cooking should happen. Chefless cooking without without losing the essence and the art and the magic. Um, so that's a big part of the technology. The second big part of the technology is actually understanding consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. Like our movies, our music, all these things have gotten personalized, right? Netflix can tell you, you know, what movie would you like. Spotify can tell you what music. Food is so personal, but it has not been personalized. Like you go to a restaurant, the person doesn't know you, doesn't know whether you are vegetarian, vegan, whether you love meat, whether you are 
you know, you, you are a connoisseur of cheese. None of this information is actually used to serve you the dish that you really, really love. That's the second big technology that's going to come in. Understanding people's food habits. Like, for example, you, you know, when you're ordering food, you're allergic to nuts. So you say, I'm allergic to nuts. The food is going to be prepared according to your uh, dietary needs. So there's a massive amount of technology that's now coming into it. And as we know today, food tech. Food tech is not delivery tech. It's not logistics tech. You know, worldwide we know food tech as what DoorDash is doing or, or uh, Deliveroo is doing, which, which is taking food from one place to another. That's not food tech, that's logistics. Real food tech is changing the food, making it personalized, making it specific to your need. That's a big change that's gonna happen. In 20 years, you know, how people consume food is gonna be completely different. This is fascinating. I'm sure you all agree with me in the audience. And a question for you. I read that the way you operate your cloud kitchens, your inter uh, internet kitchens, is um, it's organized by workflows rather than restaurants. So do you ever get mixed up? I don't know, the, the Italian with the sushi with, <laughs> with, is there confusion in your cloud kitchen? So there will be some outliers always, but uh, but the way I think about this is, again, something uh, sort of uh, almost like a blasphemy saying this, but, you know, if you look at a car factory, when you launch a new car, like a sedan versus an SUV, you don't change the factory. You don't, you know, add new space. Because as I was saying, most food is prepared following a certain mechanism. Like, as I was saying, dispensing, tossing, stirring, frying, you know, heat from below and things like that. So you organize your kitchen based on these processes. Mm -hmm. And different brands use a different workflow to go through these processes. Rather than, you know, that's the beauty of a cloud kitchen. That you can organize it like a factory with nicely laid out processes one after the other. And different brands follow different processes. That takes away the humongous requirement of space, especially in country like India or large parts of Middle East, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, where real estate is very costly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the costliest thing in the world. And in fact, rent to sales ratio in India is the highest in the world for restaurants. That tells you how costly real estate is. If we can create mechanisms through which we don't have to add space mm -hmm. for adding a new restaurant or a new brand, then that's tremendous. So exactly um, that's how we look at it. Fantastic to hear about food tech and everything you're doing. It really is great. And you're in over a hundred, how many countries? 11, over 10 countries? Now over 10 countries, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Wish you the best of luck. All right, I want to go now. So you get to hear about it just before lunch. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Mohammed, you bring up a good point. Food tech and uh, absolutely. And uh, it not affecting the, the actual flavor. Exactly. Incredible. Oh, it really is. All right, let's continue. I want to go to you, Mr. Uh, Seguin. I work as a news presenter, and when I talk about Africa, oh, especially in the past two years, it has mainly been about the vaccine inequity, some political instability. Um, and it, I found it fascinating to read that COVID-19 has actually boosted the uptake of digital technologies in Africa. So what has that meant for your company and what have you been doing during the pandemic? Yes, COVID-19 did a lot of stuff to many parts of the world, Africa not excluded. But in Africa, it was a bag of misblessings. In some parts of the continent, it accelerated digitization, which uh, has been the buzzword in most parts of the world. If I mention a number of countries, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, you've seen a lot of entrepreneurs in the tech sector now. And whatever they're doing now was accelerated by COVID. So what I want to put across is that, yes, few people died, but it created a new wave of industry, a new wave of entrepreneurs who created new industries out of this pandemic. Pandemic is never a good thing, by the way. Nobody wished for the pandemic. But out of that, a lot of new talents came up. And what turned is our industry became an enabler for so many other industries. Jadi was talking about the food sector now. The connectivity is provided by a telecommunications company. If you're talking about connecting investors, KYA and other investors, 
we just the foundation upon which every other thing rests now, whether you're in the food sector, whether you're in the manufacturing sector, everything is going online, and we provide the foundation upon which everything rests. We also replace so many things in Africa. We've replaced transportation. Instead of taking a bus, a plane from one part of the continent to another, you make a phone call, that's a replacement. We've replaced entertainment. People consume entertainment on their mobile device now. In most parts of Africa, this is the first thing you touch when you wake up. It's the last thing you touch when you go to bed. You don't joke with it. So this has created so many opportunities to connect people with their passion, whether you want to consume education, you can consume education on this mobile device. If you want to consume entertainment, it can be consumed on this device. Even health services are being offered across mobile devices now. It's a game changer for us. Not COVID, but digitization is changing the way we do things in Africa. Absolutely. And what does it mean, this digitalization uh, for the way you do things in Africa and the technology mean for the people that don't have access to traditional banking? For example, just in Nigeria, about 36% uh, 36, 36 of the adult population don't have access to traditional banking. So what has all of this meant for them? What we've done is to take banking away from the four walls of a building and we've converted banking into a service. It can be consumed with a mobile device. So with a wallet, a digital wallet in your phone, you can pay for services any part of the world. We've also created a new set of entrepreneurs, especially women who live in rural areas, by turning them into agents who convert cash into digital currency for a very small fee. We're creating livelihoods for them as well. So for most of us in Africa, Launching mobile money is not only a profit imperative, it's also a social issue for us. We lift in a lot more people out of poverty, especially women. And if you look at mobile coverage in Africa, about 15, 16% of Africa is still not covered by mobile internet. Even those who are covered, they don't use. Why are they not using? Media, they don't have the financial resources, they don't have the digital skills to use, or they just can't afford the device to consume the mobile money opportunity. So what we do in Africa is bridging to divide, the financial divide and the digital divide. The financial divide, we bring a lot more people to the financial sector, we offer insurance services, we offer investment opportunities, saving opportunities, and even just taking that cash away from where it's not productive, putting it in the financial sector, creates a lot more value for everyone ultimately. And give us some examples of the, the, the people that you're lifting out of poverty. How is that, that changing? You know, in, in some parts of the world, not only I mean, in Africa, low and middle income countries, an income of about two, three dollars a day can change the face of a family. If you're able to provide an opportunity for somebody, we take it for granted, that's how much we pay for a bottle of Coke or Fanta in most part of the world. But two, three dollars a day can make it easier for a family to train women, to train children, provide education, provide food, access medical care. And that's what I see in Africa that uh, my company and other similar size companies are doing. Because with success comes obligation. If you're a very successful business in Africa, in any part of the world, you owe the community an obligation to lift a lot more people out of poverty. And that's why most of our businesses, they have this human face. It's not such motivation of making money. It's a twin objective. How do you lift a lot more people out of poverty and at the same time continue to deliver sufficient returns to your shareholders? Both are necessary and they are not mutually exclusive. Beautiful to hear that. And what happens when you do actually um, empower so many people in Africa, 1.2 billion, um, and as you say, with success comes obligation and there is a human face to what you do? You know, even for you to thrive as a company, you need a large community of those who have the right purchasing power to buy your products, whatever you're selling. So it's actually in our own self-interest to create a very prosperous society, a prosperous community. And it takes away so many things away from people. It minimizes crime. This social inequality is not ideal for the rich. It's not ideal for the poor as well, because you don't want poor the boys around you. So the social imperative actually is also necessary for businesses to continue to thrive in Africa and most parts of the world, not only Africa and Mossad. 
Thank you so much. Really great to hear about the work you're doing with Airtel. All right, I'm going to move next now to Hande. Hande, we hear that data is the new oil of the digital era. And you are, you are doing very interesting things with with data. What have you been doing exactly during the pandemic and what opportunities has this crisis brought to you? Uh, thank you very much. It's a great question. I think uh, when we look at the trends after the pandemic or still in the pandemic era, there will be, uh, we can see that there are three major areas uh, that we are observing the changes drastically. The first one is uh, of course, the customers or let's say the brands uh, or the way they interact with their clients, it changed actually very uh, drastically. And the second thing is the way we work, we, work, we start to work remotely. And the third thing is actually the cloud and uh, the uh, importance of cloud in our lives. So when we take into account the first change, the way that we interact, the brands start to interact with their customers is, as we all know, uh, online purchases has increased, digitalization, uh, the digital transformation processes has been accelerated like three to four, by three to four years. And then we look at the also customers interactions with the, with the brands, we can see that globally they have been increased by 58% on digital, in digital. So that's why it shows us, the, it starts shows us the importance of the data, in total importance of the online data also has increased uh, especially after the pandemic. So that's why what we are doing is by, the, by leveraging technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning, in other words, doing it smart, we are doing this smartly, we help global brands to interact with their users by knowing who they are, what are their preferences, and what are their priorities, and also we do predictions accordingly. Uh, I think uh, the new concept of the world is website per person or uh, application per person. So this is what we are trying to also enable for the uh, online brands or e-commerce companies. Because when a user lands in a website or mobile app, they would like to see relevant content. They would like to see something personalized. So that's why the data of the users became uh, is becoming more and more important for the brands it's it's actually also what we do uh, offering them uh, smarter and also more interactive ways of uh, communicating with their uh, end users it's fascinating to hear about Ota, data and how you, you say that online data now is, is more important has increased during the pandemic yeah. so does that make us here C consumers or brands, given the, uh, the amount of data that you know about us? Um, actually, um, yes. As I think what we are trying to ask is, how do customers feel about that? Yes. They said no. Okay. So I think uh, in the first years of uh, personalization or usage of the personalization technologies, users were more concerned about it because brands start to get to know them more and is it an opportunity or is it not an opportunity? But when they start to discover that, it they gives us more engagement with the brands, feeling special. I think this interaction also became become like a win-win situation for both of the parties, for both for the brands and also for the end users. Uh, because at the end of today, for example, by the utilization of prediction, uh, predictive technologies, uh, we can predict users' demographics, uh, income level, what type of brands they love more or what do they would like to purchase. So that's why feeling this when you interact with a brand creates like a more sentimental interaction for the users. So that's why it helps brands to build more emotional connection with these brands. And this is what they are looking for, right, at this era. So I think uh, it's a great opportunity for both the customer side and also uh, for the brands. So you say it's a great opportunity, but should we be scared about the amount of data that is out there about us? Uh, we shouldn't, because we are not talking about your like very personal data that you wouldn't prefer to share. We are talking about your like behaviors, which will help you to uh, you know have a more 
personalized experience when you would like to buy something or when you would like to engage with a service or if you would like to buy a, you know, goods. I think um, with the regulations in Europe, in Asia, in America, like GDPR, uh, and also a lot of regulations also or laws has been established in US for this, including uh, this part of the world also in Asia and in Middle East, I think the rights and also personal, very personal data of the consumers uh, is being protected anyway. So I think we should be scared of it. Uh, and uh, especially after this, uh, you know, cookie-less world policies, I think for the consumers, everything will be much more safer. Uh, however, if we are talking about the big data, by the way, what big data meaning is, when you enter or when you interact with a channel, according to, by the way, research, each user is interacting at least with six channels for, the, for a brand, meaning you are there interacting in, with your WhatsApp or with the uh, mobile app or with the email or whatever. Uh, so when they interact through those six channels, when we feel like, you know, we are trying to get to know our users more, when they see the benefit of this, and also when we are protected by the regulations, I think it's not a scary thing, it's something we all need because our time is quite valuable and we don't want to lose the time by seeing the services or goods or offerings that we don't want to see. So that's why uh, I think, uh, especially by the smart usage of the artificial intelligence and machine learning, it becomes like a, you know, less concern for the users all around the world. That's what I think. Excellent. And very quickly, how are you using artificial intelligence with the data and everything you do? Because when I hear the word artificial intelligence and data, it does make me scared. <laughs> well, actually, we use them uh, to define the predictions regarding the user. Because if you look at the just user's historical segmentation, yes, it can give you an idea about this user. Uh, but if you are going to also utilize the artificial intelligence or machine learning, then it means you can include more than 60 parameters, 70 parameters in your algorithms, and these algorithms help you to make smarter predictions about the users. For example, um, there are some algorithms that we are utilizing more than 60 parameters, including their past purchases, past behaviors, and the prices that they have chosen to make the purchase, or how many minutes they have stayed on each page. So putting all of those predictions, we create algorithms, which is going to give us a, let's say, uh, I'm sure sorry to use that word, but I think it's the right word to use, less dump predictions about the users. Less so that's dump, okay. Yeah. So that's actually what we do. Fantastic. Now, I have to ask you this, because you were selected, named by uh, Microsoft as the most successful woman yeah. entrepreneur of the year. Yeah. Is there something that women in tech do differently? I wouldn't say that this is, there is something different about women in tech. There must be something about, different about the women, uh, women entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm not saying this, of course, uh, you know, women are better than men, men are better than women. At the end of the day, we are all equal, as we all know. However, we have some certain, uh, I think, uh, advantages over each other. And I believe that as an entrepreneur, most of the time, you make your decision based on the data plus based on your gut feelings because sometimes and most of the times you don't have the data. And once you don't have the data, then your uh, gut feelings actually comes in. And then when your gut feelings actually comes in, I believe that women are doing better than this uh, to, make, to make the decisions based on their gut feelings. I believe that we have stronger predictions based on our feelings. So that's why I think uh, women in entrepreneurship or women entrepreneurs can do a really great job. But it should be encouraged more uh, in technology or in all the in other uh, areas. I know that many different investors, many different like, uh, you know, companies are already running a lot of programs for this. By the way, Insider, our company is also backed by QA and Sequoia Capital. And I, I know that they're also doing like a lot of special programs to encourage women in tech. Uh, so again, yes, we need to encourage uh, this, but it's not about uh, only women in tech. It's I think women's sh women should become 
you know, entrepreneurs, uh, and we should see like a, you know, mosaic in the world, a combination of the manpower and female power. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Hande. Fantastic. And we'll be speaking a bit more about uh, what it takes to be an entrepreneur during uh, this post-pandemic era shortly. Right. So many of you in the audience have had to school, homeschool your children during this pandemic. And it's been, I'm sure, quite a challenge. Now, our guest at the end has made this um, his life, his business. Um, so we know it's caused a disruption for millions of children. And I have to start with this, first of all, your social impact initiative, which is called Education for All. You launched this during the pandemic and you have empowered 3.4 million children from the most remotest parts of India to be able to learn. How have you done this? Thank you. So I'll start with, uh, with, with pandemic starting almost two years back. And if something like this would have happened 100 years back, there would have been a 100% learning loss. Today we are talking about learning gap and not learning loss because of how teachers have changed, how stu all stakeholders immediately moved online and started learning at home. Otherwise, we, the scenario would have been much worse. Today, everyone talks about learning gap. I do agree. Everyone talks about digital divide. So with pandemic, uh, immediately we decided to uh, make a difference to the students those who were having not access to a device. So by working with partners, both NGOs and government, we were able to launch this Education for All program within the first two weeks of the pandemic uh, with a aim to reach out to 5 million students in two years. The first year itself, we were able to make a difference to 3.4 million students. We got uh, second devices from many people to donate because almost all of us have the the top one third of India, all of them will have a second device. We were able to collect uh, more than a million devices from uh, our paid students as well as uh, parents. And that's how we started. And then uh, we were able to partner with 100 plus NGOs and made a difference to, uh, uh, like today, there are 3.4 million students, for most of whom this is their primary mode of learning. These were students, those who were even pre-pandemic, were not able to go to school because unfortunately we were still uh, uh, the bottom 15, 20 percentage of students in India out of almost 300 million students. So we have the largest school age population in the world. Uh, so I'm for, uh, like fortunate to be in a sector which is of positive relevance and being able to make an impact on both sides of the spectrum, creating one of the largest for-profit education companies, but more importantly, making a difference to the bottom two, three percentile of the students in India. Absolutely incredible. Um, before we came on stage, you showed me a video of you teaching maths in a in a stadium. So there must have been what th thousands of, of, of students in there. Um, but, so talk to us about what you bring because you you make learning fun, don't you? You bring in your love for maths, your love for learning, your love of, of sports, and. I also watched a video where you were talking about making quadratic equations, very easy. I don't even know what that is. Um, but you managed to do that and inspire people and make them learn. How do you do that? Because this is beyond the technology that uh, we're talking about. Yes. Uh, in initial years, like I, I'll say reason for our, I'll only use the word relative success. Still, there's a long way to go because Unfortunately, education is one of those sectors where technology was late in entering. It's uh, in, in making an impact. Though pandemic has accelerated that behavior across all stakeholders. What for me, uh, I, I'll dramatize the story by telling that I come from a small village, went to in school where forget about finding good teachers, finding teachers itself was a challenge, which forced me to become a self learner. So I used to teach in my class in school, in village, and then in college. What started like that? ended up becoming big, still in that pursuit of how to make it bigger and more importantly, better. So kept on increasing, moving from classrooms to auditoriums to stadiums at its peak. Uh, there used to be 25,000 students learning math. So when you teach in a stadium like that, you can't teach math. You had to almost elevate that to the level of a math concert. Now, how do you find uh, the biggest challenge we face today is uh, uh, it's unfortunately learning driven by fear of exams in most parts of Asia. 
and not love for learning. All of us learning today, like from like I've learned a lot from all four of them in the last 30 minutes is because uh, we are curious, we want to learn. And how do we bring that childlike curiosity back in students? How do you find that right balance between keeping it engaging without losing its effectiveness? How we consume content, uh, or like how we consume entertainment that has changed uh, a lot in the last 10 years. It's personalized, we get what we like. How do we do that in education? How do we put the right amount of chocolate coating before we take them through the broccoli? That's where we've been able to differentiate. Now, that chocolate coating can vary from, sometimes it can be engaging characters which kids like, and we teach uh, before we bring the rigor of learning. And uh, so we, we create, uh, last 12 months, we have created more than 5,000 movies uh, from our studio in Bangalore. The difference is these are, I'm talking about math movies and science games. So we have probably the largest movie studio, math studio in India, bigger than entertainment. Now, that way we are making it easy for students. Rather than just learning, reading from a book, we are able to enhance that experience by teaching them through movies, games. Now, we are moving to a world where uh, competency matters more than credentials. And with everything getting decentralized, uh, we can make high quality education accessible to millions of students and billions of students and that's at, at least that's the aspiration and you want to keep on going don't you you want to reach another touch the lives of another 10 million more children um, even though many will be going back to school physically right so how will you do this so the, the fact is though everyone talks about digital divide the inequities which exist in our physical world it's, it's uh, especially solving them at scale, whether it's access to teachers, access to uh, personalizing the way students learn. You can teach in a classroom, but for learning to be personalized, it's, it's, you can do a much better job when you do it online, when you are actually able to use uh, the interactions with students do on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the screen. Now, that's where, uh, so the real impact of technology is not just for solving access, but also improving effectiveness or efficiency of learning, creating better learning outcomes. So. Uh, but can we build more schools and get better, more teachers into classrooms like in, in countries like India? It's almost impossible to solve. So physical divide do exist. It's the best chances, like a cost effective way of solving all these challenges at scale in education is, is by creating an online model and or some kind of a hybrid model where we bring the best of both online and offline. And, and that's how uh, in, in a short span of time, we have been able to create one of the largest not-for-profit initiatives in India in, in, in the last 18 months by using technology uh, because as, uh, as and when the infrastructure is improving with more and more students getting access to a device or coming on like with, with, the, uh, uh, with uh, the, there is, uh, that's easier to solve. Otherwise, billions of dollars have been spent in uh, building schools, but how do you get uh, uh, personalization? How do you get teachers into the schools is a big challenge. Wish you the best of luck. Incredible job you're doing there. And I wish you had been my, my maths teacher, maths movie. I would have I would have been, yeah, had better math skills today. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. What I want to do is quickly, um, have some, some quick fire questions to you all. Um, first, of you, first of all, to you, Mohammed. Um, we have an audience here that have ideas. Everybody has an idea. Your advice, you know, when you hear clients come to you that are surrounded by doubters, naysayers, and lots of instability, global instability, what advice would you give to somebody that wants to make it in their startup or, or with the, the idea that they have right now? Um, so you kind of think of like an entrepreneur who would yes. like to establish a business? Uh, first of all, is I mean, um, he or she has have to be really passionate on, on the idea and really think about the gaps in the world as, as they approach thinking about that specific investments. I think passion um, um, has to be there. The trusting the process when it comes to failure and continuing to work and walk and trying to figure out gaps and try to use along, it's probably so, so the passion and the trusting the process probably number one, the way I think about it. The second is trying to have partners with, without you, around you mm -hmm. and behind you that truly really are convinced of your ability to deliver and be with you along the journey and accept that along the way you may have, um, you make mistakes or you may miss markets or you may experience, you know, hyper volatility in markets as you're seeing now. 
So think of the idea, having the right system around you, probably I'll say that the, you know, the first, uh, the most important two things um, any entrepreneur has to have, uh, have in his mind. Fantastic, good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, to you, Jaideep, now, do you think the pandemic has changed the DNA of the future entrepreneur? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I, one of my favorite book is uh, Talib's um, Anti-Fragile, you know, where, you know, entrepreneurship is like muscle building. Um, the muscle gets stronger when you put stress in the muscle. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why you exercise. You break it, but when the muscle builds up again, it becomes stronger. I think the process of entrepreneurship, when it goes through a deep sort of struggle like pandemic, I think the anti-fragility kind of develops in people. And, you know, we've seen in the last sort of crisis, 2008-9, lot of new age businesses came out of that, Airbnb and a few others. Crisis creates that anti-fragility in, in entrepreneurs. And people start thinking in new directions, new imagination happens. So I, I really think that this would be uh, the next decade of um, terrific innovation around the world by entrepreneurs. Crisis creates anti-fragility in entrepreneurs. I love it, fantastic. Um, Next to you, Mr. Segun, um, what would you say is the business legacy of the pandemic, in your opinion? It is about uh, the power of digitization, of how when you digitize, you can deliver value to multiple stakeholders, whether the customers, the consumers, the government, everybody benefits from digitization. And it's not just changing your front face, it's about changing the back office, the front office, but if you change only the front page, just cosmetic, you need to change the old processes to reflect the fact that digital is the way to go. And this should be done across multiple channels, whether customers are coming to you on the web, they're coming to you via the app. And I see channel that is very popular in Africa, USSD, because most people in Africa use picture phone. That's another channel. Just make sure the experience across the app, across the web, USSD or even IBL, this, the experience is consistent and that creates value. And I'm also seeing that uh, companies that uh, focus on pipeline and just produce one thing, they're probably gonna find it more difficult to survive because the world is moving towards an ecosystem. Whether you're part of a larger framework and uh, you produce one part, but there's another member of the ecosystem that is making sure that part that is being produced is being delivered to the customer. There's a payment mechanism whereby the customers are paying for it. All the dots are being linked together and that's the new world we're in. An ecosystem of customers, consumers, producers, manufacturers, merchants, everyone putting some small thing into the ecosystem and everyone taking some small value, creating a very active and connected world. That is what I think is gonna happen in the next decade. Fantastic, thank you very much indeed. Hande, to you, is there a motto that you have lived by during this pandemic? Is there something that you always say and believing that just, you know, gets you through? I can mention two different mottos. One is actually internal one for insiders. We always wanted to give that the, the, this feeling to the also team, uh, like we are all in this together. That was the internal motto at Insider, that we, while, while we are going through these tough times. External mottos, couple of them. Uh, actually, building a, a technology company story, uh, selling to 26 different uh, countries in the world, working with more than 1,000 enterprise clients is not easy. Because unfortunately, this part of the world uh, is not perceived as a you know, region raising high-tech companies, so it wasn't an easy story. Uh, so this is why actually we always promoted, uh, you know, internally and externally that our aim is to show whole world that breakthrough product companies can also uh, come outside of Silicon Valley. And that's why, while we are doing this, we always believe like, um, we do this uh, for our country, for our people, 
uh, for our families. So we have these hashtags for our country, for our people, for our family. And uh, anything can happen in the world, like pandemic. Uh, and this is why the last motto I would say, uh, I would say, which we, where we have actually inspired from is expect the unexpected. Fantastic. And I have that quote from you here, where you say, we are determined to show that a software company from the east of the world will succeed in Silicon Valley. So exactly. I'm also proud to mention it because it's a great opportunity for me to uh, maybe raise this here while we are all together in this conference. Uh, Insider uh, in his in its own industry also has been recognized as the leader leaving to leaving behind. Uh, he's very deep pocketed competitors like Adobe Oracle uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that we have shown all world that it's also possible from this region. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. My last question to you, Biju. Um, your motto that you lived through, that same question to Handy during this pandemic, and how did you inspire the millions of children that you, know, you teach? But for you personally, your motto. Yeah. For, for me, uh, it's, it's always been. Uh, like I, I always say I'm living my dream. I've been fortunate that my passion around learning math and teaching math and like always thinking about how to make it bigger, more importantly, better. So pandemic has accelerated a lot of things, which otherwise would have taken maybe five or 10 years more in terms of how students learn, how teachers teach, how institutions go online. But uh, having that long term thinking. So like investors always talk about uh, uh, Long term, so I ask them what is long term. So they normally say the best answer I've got is 10 years. Uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, create something generational. Now, when you keep uh, that level of an aspiration and when you both in terms of what you want to do and how long you want to do, chances are that anything over long term, especially if you are truly passionate about what you do, it's bound to work. Fantastic. And thank you all of you for your inspiration and your insights today. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in thanking our guests here today. Thank you, you. Mohamed al uh, JD Barman, Segun Ogunsanya, Handa Chilingir, and Guju Ravindran. Thank you all so